I am Guido Nunez Mujica. I am from Merida, Venezuela. That's in the Andes. I mean, so it's a mountain town, university town. Why I'm in TED? Yes. Because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you're showing off at, at TED this week? What are you, to, what are you talking about at TED? Uh, the general, I have actually two presentations, but the unifying subject is the biotechnology is becoming cheaper and cheaper, and what will be the consequences, the possibilities of that, where the technologies are making that possible. Okay, so what will be the consequences of that? You can, you could trace an analogy with uh, computers. Four years ago they were huge and you need to program in things that you need to know now. You can have now your netbook, you need to know programming. So I think that biotechnology is going to drop the price and it's going to be become easier. So now, for instance, local producers can make their, their own crops tailored to their weather and soil conditions and to their local plagues rather than waiting for Monsanto to develop a crop that is sort of one size fits all. Okay. So it's about um, sort of as technology advances, rolling that into communities around the world. Is that right? Yeah, you could say it's a decentralizing of science and research. Okay, and um, what what impacts does does that effect have on communities? Uh, for instance, one propose uh, one propose uh, outcome of this could be engineer yogurt bacteria, so they produce vitamin C. So when people eat them, they won't have scurvy anymore. Because for instance, uh, other animals, other mammals like dogs and cats, they will never have scurvy because they are actually able to produce vitamin C. We primates are unable, but our bacteria cool. So you could get rid of scurvy or you could get your drugs or your vaccines from certain types of bacteria. So that will diminish the cost of actually manufacturing the vaccine and keeping it cold and... Okay. And what's your background? Where, where, where is this uh, come from? Why have you decided that this is what you want to focus on? I'm a computational biologist. And it's, it's quite um, two main reasons. One, uh, I was doing research that I love. It was a mathematical model, but it was too abstract and uh, it really didn't change anything and there's really a lot of unmet needs and things that need to be solved. So I think it's rather what I should be doing is focusing on something that can make a difference now that instead of something that might make a difference in 20 years. And the other reason is that as a biologist, I don't think that there's anything that I have done in my undergrad that could not have been done by kids in high school or even in middle school if they have the interest and the means. And biotechnology can be a powerful force for change, but still too expensive. So if I can help to drop the cost of this, uh, it can help people and it can empower people also. Okay. And uh, do you sort of have any examples of uh, sort of miniaturization of, of these things that... Uh, that yes, right here. <laughs> Uh, this is a PCR machine. It's basically some sort of uh, DNA Xerox machine but that's only able to copy this very specific sequence billions of times. So it's like having a Xerox machine that scans your whole library looking for a certain paragraph and it finds a paragraph, you have a ton of copies of that same paragraph. If not, you don't have any output. This is the, this this uh, this machine does that for DNA. Okay, and are they cheap? Are they easy to roll out around the world? Yes, uh, this is only a prototype version, and we're now we're trying to manufacture a final version. But uh, it's easier than current technology for machines are this size, three thousand uh, dollars. We wanted this to be less than five hundred dollars, and it's handheld. So this is an example, there are some more examples of how can technology drop the price and be easier to maintain. For instance, there are reagents for doing uh, tests for infectious diseases that now you need to keep them in the freezer. Okay, okay. 
Yeah. And uh, when, you know, when, when, what, sorry, I'm trying to formulate this question right. Uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of effects are you hoping that at the, in the long term, this decentralization is going to have on, uh, on the world globally? Well, uh, people could solve their very specific problems and uh, using better technology rather than using this kind of one-size-fits-all solutions, rather than using uh, broad-range pesticides. If they know exactly what they're dealing with, they could target very precisely, so minimizing the damage to other species, to other organisms that are not the intended target. Uh, you could have a real-time epidemiology, so next time we have something like AIDS, it doesn't blow up on our face like it happened with AIDS, so we know that something is happening and we can detect it and we can act with the new, new technologies that we have. It will be fairly easy, but now, again, now they are too centralized. If you deploy like a network of sensors, machines like these or something similar, or maybe even pocket sequencers, DNA sequencers, you could be ready and you could know that something's going on and you could stop. Next time we have a bird flu, we could know in real time and we could know in, oh, I better not go to the airport because I have this alert that there are 10 cases in the airport. It's showing on my Google Maps. Real time epidemiology is a definite possibility of this.